to have you here and I hope that this video is going to answer the questions you may have about ground orchids or terrestrial orchids. Even if you are cultivating your ground orchids successfully and are still here, thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Let me know if this video provided you with some intel that you could consider applying to your ground orchids or if you have anything to add in form of more information in the comments, that would be very welcome. Because Diana Wilson requested this video and would like to get the hang of them. And I am totally with Diana on that because they are so beautiful and in the right climate and conditions, they can even live in the ground as their general category title states. But as you can see with my little selection here, there's a Cymbidium, a Phaeus and my two Blatias. They are in pots and not in the ground because the property I live in is a rental and should I ever have to move out, then I want to be able to take my orchids with me without digging them up at the wrong time of year and setting them back. Worst case scenario, destroying them. And because the Blatias were gifts from Fernanda Nacimento orchids and succulents, they are very precious to me and hopefully will continue growing from strength to strength and maybe bloom for us come spring 2023. So let's address the fact that Diana specifically pointed out Spathyloglottis, and yet I don't have that genus. Instead, I have Blatia. Well, the care requirements are exactly the same, so whatever pointers I mentioned today will also apply to Spathyloglottis. As the name of this group of orchids points us in the direction of ground orchids or terrestrial orchids, we can take from that that they can be planted in the landscape much like you would any other perennial. Because Spathyloglottis and Blitias are just that, perennials. So if you see that your Spathyloglottis is starting to brown at the outer edges of the leaves and it is full, that means the orchid is starting to absorb the leaves, drawing the energy into the bulbs and the whole leaf will eventually go completely brown and you can remove it once it comes off with a loose tug. Or as you can see with this leaf here, when I moved the orchid to set up my little display, it fell off. It's already a goner, but the time of year determines that. That is normal. And here's another one that looks pretty, pretty past its due by date. And just with a little bit of a touch, it fell off easily as well. That is what I consider loose tug and it is done. It has done its job for the growing season. Thank you for your service. But if the leaves are going brown during the growing season, starting spring through summer, that is not normal. They should be a light, fresh green in color and maybe darken a little bit depending on where they are cultivated, meaning if they are more shaded. The more light they get, the green hue will have a little more of a light yellow appearance, but still the green color should dominate. Any browning at the edges of the leaves is a result of possibly lacking four things combined, or one of the four is lacking. The first one being too much light exposure. The second, too much heat. The third, not enough humidity. And the fourth, not enough airflow. With these four indicators in mind, it is easier to understand why a Spathyloglottis or a Blatia is browning at the leaves prematurely. In that case, if the orchid is not moved or one of the four requirements is not provided, the orchid will struggle. At this point, it will not die, but it will struggle. Even if relief of the conditions is provided, the browning will stay on the leaves until fall because they're falling off. <laughs> and then we get another chance at getting it right the next season. At least there's that when it comes to these orchids, but not including the Cymbidiums or Fias. I just put them all together because these are my ground orchids, terrestrial orchids in my collection. So in my super dry climate, my mistake in the first year of having my Blatia striata was I knew they like to be in a sunny location. So there is your light requirement. They like a lot of light. They need a lot of light to bloom and they can handle direct sun depending on where you are growing them, either in your landscape, your conservatory, grow space, etc. because the intensity of light is relative. Now, I am here in southern Spain and while I cannot seem to get the heat index to match my personal preferences, <laughs> the light levels are higher than, for example, if you were growing your ground orchids further north of my location. So when I put mine into direct sun, even if I have plenty of airflow, it is too hot for the palm-like leaf structures to cope. 
and not get singed. If, however, I had enough humidity to balance the heat on the leaves out, then they would probably be able to handle my direct sun much better. However, I have a super dry climate and average 30% of humidity throughout the year, so direct sun, warm dry winds are a big no-no during the growing season. So there are the elements which ground orchids require to grow well without burning leaves. Humidity above 50% on average. These are the elements which ground orchids require to grow well without burning leaves prematurely. A humidity above 50% on average, high light with direct sun if the temperatures are not extreme and there is plenty of airflow. I am bringing this to your attention because the symptoms of too harsh conditions and the result of those are exactly the same as what you see on my bletillas now. But what they're doing now is totally normal because it is fall. So having learned the limits of what a ground orchid can tolerate in my conditions, this season I did not expose my bletillas to direct sun. They lived in what I call the deep south where they get exposed to very bright light but are in actual fact in the shade. The foliage maintained its beautiful green throughout the season and only recently did the leaves start to show senescing. The deep south also provides a lot of humidity seeing as the hedge corner has a little microclimate of its own. That is why my angrecoids have their summer camp in that location. Direct sun further north or south of my location and depending on which hemisphere you find yourself in will permit direct sun influence because usually it doesn't get as hot in those parts of the world as it does where I am and there is more humidity as well. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> let's just scratch 2022 where things were totally reversed and the north of Europe got super hot while here in Spain, well, we had mild temperatures in comparison and I was super envious. <laughs> So, take note that if you can grow your ground orchids in the ground, and if your climate may have extreme conditions, it will make it necessary to provide some form of relief for your cluster of ground orchids to avoid burning their leaves. Having mentioned that if you were able to grow your ground orchids in the ground, which is definitely the beauty of these orchids because it makes them easy to grow and they will grow into a beautiful cluster. However, in the ground does not mean soil. If your temperatures do not ever get to freezing conditions, you can plant the bulb-like structures in your landscape and let them go and grow, much like you would be able to do with a cluster of iris. But you would need to prep the area you plant them in with a soil mix that has a lot of drainage. You can add leca or a horticultural grit, even making a huge batch of orchid bark and adding some general potting soil to that will do. But stop right there, your mind may be leaning towards cymbidium style media mix because, again, if your temperatures do not drop to the point of the ground freezing, you can plant some bidiums into your landscape as you can do fires. But again, let me stop you with that medium mix because I don't want you to think, yes, I've got bark, yes, I've got soil mix, happy days. Because the root system of a spathyloglottis is much, much smaller and finer than the chunky roots of a cymbidium and the medium-sized roots of a fires. We have to take into consideration the structure of the root system of a spathyloglottis or a bletia. They are completely different to cymbidium or fires roots. So if the area in your garden is not free draining and the ratio of how much grit should you add is not something you want to risk making a mistake with, then I would dig out a patch in the landscape, remove the soil and fill the hole with cactus mix from the garden center and then place the bulbs into that specifically prepped area and not too deep. Once again, I'm going to refer to think of how you would plant clusters of iris. They are planted shallow and are barely covered with media. The same with spathyloglottis and bletias. Oh, and if you have pets that love to dig in your landscape, you definitely want to protect the bulbs from being interfered with. Depending on the time of year ground orchids are planted in the landscape, don't water them in or give the patch a good drink in the event that it is spring. 
which is the season that I recommend to plant them if they are going into the landscape. It does not matter if the bulbs show above the level of the media once you've watered them in. And I will always reference irises because the growth habit and planting depth is very, very similar. And I would highly recommend that the planting happens while the orchid is still dormant so that there is no transplant shock. That is why my second Blatia is still in its nursery container as it arrived earlier this year and had already come with the foliage. Once she loses the leaves, we will do a potting up tutorial if potting up your Spathyloglottis is the way you intend to grow it. And despite just having said that I recommend spring for planting ground orchids, and yet here I will be potting mine up once she drops her leaves and that could be winter, the potting up is different than planting in the landscape. There are not that many elemental dangers of freshly planted ground orchids in a pot, as there would be out in the landscape. If it rains too much, I can move the pot under cover, which is a little harder to do in the landscape. Now that does not mean that it is necessary that the bulbs are dry all winter, even while in the pot. But because the air is cooler and there's more humidity in the air, the pot won't go bone dry. But in the case of freshly not established bulbs, they should not be exposed to those extremes because there is a risk of rotting them out. Once they have had one year in their location, the chances of anything rotting are very slim. For that reason, any planting of ground orchids in the landscape is best done in spring, whether they have broken dormancy and are growing new shoots or not. This way, the cluster, the new bulbs can establish themselves throughout the growing season, go dormant in their spot, and then they can handle the weather conditions so much better while they are dormant. The bulbs will develop a new growth in spring along a tight rhizome and eventually the older bulb will deteriorate. It doesn't happen as fast like it would with a pleione. It can take a couple of years for an older bulb to deteriorate, but eventually after several years, you will be able to see the center of the patch or pot look bare like that of a cymbidium while the growths are growing outward in a sort of circle. So based on what I just mentioned, the example of my first Platea is, she is just finishing off her second full season on my patio and I potted her up while she was just leafing out and that was not too late to do, the timing was okay. There was no transplant shock, she continued to grow and then in the spring of 2022, I had 10 new growths sprouting. Which are the ones you see now? <laughs> the vigor of this orchid has me thinking that my pot will already be too small for the 2023 growing season. But at this point, I'm not going to repot her and I will wait and see how she copes with growing new growth being this confined. So note to self, when it comes to potting up my variegated Blatia, we are going to need a wheelbarrow of potting media. <laughs> it is not necessary to pot up ground orchids the way I did. They are super versatile in the media choice as long as it is free draining. Remember the cactus mix option in the landscape? That would work very well for a pot as well if you prefer a classic pot with a saucer setup as opposed to, as you can see, my setup is semi-hydro and the mix I have in the pot is large lava rock, which I used as crocking, and the rest of the pot is akadama, with a top dressing of gravel to keep the surface akadama from drying out too fast, and besides, I thought it looked pretty. <laughs> now, akadama is highly water retentive, which is what these orchids like when in active growth. Access to water, but not sitting in water. They are not bog orchids. The akadama is still free draining and I like it because it doesn't break down for many many years seeing as my temperatures do not drop to the point of freezing and the structure of the media is ideal for fine rooted orchids. Side note, my other ground orchids are in Lekka and self-watering because of the size of their roots just in case you are wondering why there was a difference. So let's talk about temperature tolerance. As mentioned, there should be no threat of a freeze. So keep in mind that if you have your ground orchids in the landscape and you have one of those crazy winters that are out of the norm where there is a cold snap and temperatures may freeze for a night or a week, that you can protect your patch of ground orchids by mulching heavily and covering it with some antifreeze cloth. 
until the threat is over, but do not forget to remove that layer of mulch because at no point should these bulbs be buried deep below the surface of the ground. My temperatures have not dropped below 4 degrees Celsius, and that was a single night, but normally it hovers around 5 to 8 degrees during the night, and if we are lucky we can get 17 degrees Celsius during the day. Potted up, it is easy to bring the pot indoors, even into the garage to ride out the threat of any funky weather. While outdoors, the pot is exposed to light. Keeping a pot in the dark garage for a short stint is not going to affect the health of the bulbs in any way. The upper temperature tolerance is depending on the climate and conditions of where and how you choose to grow your ground orchids. Mine can and have to deal with temperatures up to 40 degrees Celsius. That is when leaf burn can happen. Again, just because I do not have the humidity to buffer against the dry heat. I suppose I could bring my pot indoors when I see that on the forecast, but I forget to do that and they are tough orchids, so a little leaf burn isn't going to be a detriment to the development of the bulbs. Emphasis being on the little. If many leaves would scorch over a large surface area, then of course the photosynthesis would be a problem and the bulb may not grow as strong. For the most part though, they are pretty tough, even though the leaves aren't exactly thick in their makeup. I have fertilized both the established platillas with 300 parts per million of fertilizer every time the pot feels empty or the nursery container was on the verge of going dry. But for the one still in the nursery container, the pH was at around 8. That sounds really high, but I feel that the soil in that pot is already very old and for that reason, acidic. So the high pH balances out any excessive acidity in the pot and during the season, the orchid did not have any signs of deficiencies, so I feel quite comfortable with what I did there. Deficiencies would show up in forms of a color break on the leaves, yellow patches within the structure of the leaves not to be confused with over fertilizing, which would show up as leaf tip burn. What you can see also as an example on my established platea, but that is again because it is fall and the leaves are being absorbed. However, excessive fertilizer leaf tip burn looks exactly like what I have in the pot right now. Seeing that I do not have many regular plants, I use my orchid specific fertilizer for both of these as a matter of fact, I use orchid-specific fertilizer for all my terrestrial orchids, but a generic fertilizer would also work well for these. However, while young and not established, I would also only dose at half the strength recommended by the manufacturer. If I were using generic fertilizer for the one in the nursery pot, because of the fact that it is still so small, I would go as low as a quarter strength just to be on the safe side. Usually generic fertilizers are balanced and they will pH accordingly because their makeup is for soil-based plants. So having to adjust pH when using generic fertilizer will not be necessary. For an immature colony of ground orchids in the landscape, I would fertilize a little in the first season just to give them a little help along the way. Seeing as my media is Akadama, which, while it has minerals in its own makeup, it is not a media that goes acidic. For that reason, and for the sake of convenience, I use my orchid-specific fertilizer. I also supplement with CalMag and seaweed during the growing season. I care for my ground orchids just like I care for my epiphytic orchids. I do not differentiate, and I give them the CalMag and seaweed once per month at a concentration of 60 parts per million of CalMag, and 40 parts per million of seaweed. If you grow your ground orchids in the landscape, it is not necessary for them to be supplemented in this way, seeing as there are so many nutrients accumulating around the roots from debris, etc., they have plenty to draw from. During the growing season, I do not let my pot dry out ever. I water, fertilize, and flush as and when my reservoir dries out. Then, once they are dormant, I make sure that the pot isn't always saturated and let the climate do its thing. If there is a week of rain in the forecast, I shelter the pot, but it is still outdoors. So I hope that this information will clear up any confusions about ground orchids in the landscape as well as growing them in a pot, including putting the mind at rest when it comes to browning of the leaves, leaves falling off rather radically, which can be alarming, 
but after this video I hope that it isn't anymore and the understanding of the growth cycle of a ground orchid makes it much easier to grow them successfully and have fun in doing so. I don't know about you, but there's one thing I always used to enjoy while living in Germany. That was to see the bulbs starting to sprout, be it early green leaf tips poking through a thin layer of snow, as with the snowdrops or crocuses and then tulips. It was so refreshing and fun and that is the feeling what I got out of the Blitia this spring. When I went to my pot and could count the green shoots sprouting and peeking through the layer of gravel. Ah, it was amazing. <laughs> And now we wait for blooms and I have high expectations for the striata for 2023. So this was a chatty video. I hope it wasn't too long. And if it was, I hope that it warranted the time it took for me to talk about the care of ground orchids. And if you've watched to the end, thank you so very, very much. I appreciate your time. Any questions? <laughs> the comments are there for a reason. And I look forward to engaging with you more. Thank you for your request, Diana Wilson. Let me know if this is helpful and how you progress with your ground orchids. Any and every update will be very, very welcome. Have yourself a beautiful day. On one condition though, please that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.